This is a special session financed or hosted by the Intellectual Property Issues and Cultural Heritage Project being run out of Simon Fraser University and it's been coordinated by Lena Mortensen from University of Toronto and myself with uh, the input from folks that are on the Cultural Tourism Working Group. Today I'm going to talk about my research which I, I didn't so much talk about yesterday. Um, over 10 years of research looking at native owned and operated tourism in Alaska and my subsequent comparative research looking at into Maori owned and operated tourism uh, that I've been doing for I can't believe it's been over five years now so I thought I'd start out with a picture of me and Hane Mikaha who is a tourism operator uh, outside of the Bay of Islands in New Zealand and the first Maori tourism operator I met as doing the hangi, uh, pressing of noses, which is very similar to something that's done in Alaska. So today I'm going to talk about comparing these native Alaska Native and Maori tourism models. It's, it's, I, I went to New Zealand to do a survey of Maori tourism to learn about if the issues that I knew were widespread, um, the challenges and opportunities that we faced in Alaska, if, if, if they were just solely an Alaskan thing or is it some, are, are, are the things that we face the same issues that other indigenous peoples faced around the world? So my first start was going to New Zealand and I think these two images here really, really show you how similar the tourism can be. If you just look at it, we've got um, dancers on stage. It happens to be that their traditional colors are the same. Um, red and black uh, for Maoris and and for Clinkets and Sitka, red, black, and then the third color is this, this blue-green color. On stage, this idea of that is how you, how you perform and, and visitors, visitors watching it. It just, it just looks so similar from the outside. But actually, operationally, it's extremely similar. And, and a lot of it has to do with um, a history of colonization. Sometimes I like to think of the first uh, tourism encounters between Westerners or Western Europeans and uh, indigenous or native peoples happened in these early encounters at the very beginning of the colonial period. So this is a nice image painting of Pocahontas at the English court. I think tourism really started when, um, when the Europeans, when they went to these lands that they were trying to conquer and conquest, they would um, find some enigmatic local and either convince them or more often than not drag them back to Europe to go to be shown off like a prize or, or like a souvenir from going somewhere else in the world. So it didn't just happen to Pocahontas but, but lots of people from all over the world and, and like I said oftentimes against their will. And lots of times people got sick in England, just a side note, and they would die and not make it home. That happened all the time. Uh, the pathways, and I want to talk about, they, uh, there are similar pathways to indigenous tourism that I noticed between um, not just Alaska Natives, but n native indigenous North Americans in general across the continent and, and Maoris. And um, a lot of these pathways have to do, again, with this colonial conquest. And, and part of that um, is these world's fairs that they started to have during the Victorian era. And at these world's fair, they would showcase the world and they would showcase all of the different nations that, um, that colonial nations had, had been um, exploring, exploiting, um, killing off locals, using, exploiting their resources. Um, they would have these world's fairs and they would um, bring the people from those nations that had been colonized to kind of showcase here's what here here we're adding this to our our bucket of things we've taken over here we've got this country and we've got that nation and we've conquered these people and they would bring them to the fairs and they would have them uh, like perform ceremonial dances. They would ask them to speak in their native language. They would have them uh, perform like what a wedding ceremony would look like. And they would literally live on site. And then they would build the kind of homes that they would live in back at home. And, and it was very degrading for a lot of them. But 
Um, I don't want to completely take the agency away from the people who were brought to these fairs. There are also good parts of it. People did um, get to meet other people from around the world, um, but a lot of it was very exploitative and driven by a lot of, of power dynamics. So this happened to indigenous peoples all over the world, and it kind of set the stage for indigenous representation in tourism. Uh, just very, I just want to very quickly nod to the contentious relationship between museums and indigenous peoples. Um, earlier today, we did hear some great stories about collaborations and healing some of the wounds um, that have resulted from anthropological endeavors uh, to collect artifacts of vanishing, so-called vanishing races of people. And of course, now we have native-owned museums, most of which nowadays are, are, are more like cultural centers than museums and, and not museums at all, so taking it back. And another part of this legacy of indigenous tourism is um, these folk museums. So the first folk museum uh, was started by a Swedish man named Arthur Hazilius, and um, it was outside of Stockholm. Um, as Sweden was modernizing, um, people who, uh, who people were worried that they were going to lose their folk life ways, that they were going to forget what it meant to be Sweden. So they created like a theme park that had uh, um, old-timey uh, rural Swedish villages and people dressed up in period costume and doing um, folksy things like making crafts and making traditional foods so that other Swedes could go there and learn how Sweden used to be. So it was about heritage. So this uh, kind of folk model has, that started in Sweden has kind of carried through into representations of non-Westerners and the extreme, the extreme version of it is where commercialization is as rampant as possible and the simplification of cultures is as much as possible um, would be like what they call the Disneylandification of cultures best exemplified by the It's a Small World ride at Disneyland where you can visit every major culture in the world over the course of the song being looped twice, I think. But have you guys been on that ride? About, if, about half the people in the room. What I hate about this ride is that it's like crack for you know three to six year olds and little children just love this ride and and I just know that they're just being indoctrinated into um, you know um, Dutch people wear clogs and have tulips and and Polynesian people have scary tiki fires and and it kind of uh, <laughs> burns those images into their brains so um, Part of the legacy of this, of this model, of this um, folk museum concept it was picked up by the Polynesian Cultural Center that is actually run by the Mormon Church and created as a way for um, young um, converts to Mormonism all over the Pacific to be able to go to B Brigham Young University in Hawaii and pay for their education <laughs> through tourism. It's wildly successful, wildly popular. It's probably the most successful cultural theme park in the world and just like the Skansen, the folk museum, you get to go around to little villages and you get to talk to one representative of, of that culture and do one iconic thing that represents that culture. Um, and, and it's all presented very in a very kind of shallow way. Nobody ever talks about colonialism or why they're there or, or, anything, or, or anything like that, really. Um, but, but they do put on a really good show and it's very expensive actually. Yesterday when I, some, the, for those of you who were here yesterday I talked about the Alaska Native Heritage Center um, as an excellent example of, of an indigenous cultural center but when that, when the Alaska Native Heritage Center was started one of the things that the people who created it did was visit the PCC because there was no model for this. No, we didn't know what existed. We didn't know what was out there. So it does, it does this stuff way better <laughs> in Anchorage at the Alaska Native Heritage Center because it's run by and for Alaska Natives, not by uh, you know, uh, outside religion with different goals. But, um, but, 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 uh, but the point I'm making is that a lot of indigenous tourism across the Pacific from, from Maoris to Alaska Natives kind of like unwittingly and unknowingly 
follow these legacies of representing their cultures and they don't know the ideologies or the ideas or, or, or behind how, how it got these ways of showcasing indigenous culture started in the first place. And if you understand that most of it is part of a dominating colonizing agenda to, of conquest, then you might not want to showcase your cultures these ways, if you understand that legacy of it. So um, here are two villages, Saxman, um, which is one of the first uh, Alaska Native kind of built destinations for tourists in the 70s and, and out, just outside of Ketchikan, Alaska, and Tamaki Maori Village, again, one of the first built Maori destinations um, in Rotorua, which is a big tourism hub in New Zealand. And they both are like these built spaces where you have performances, um, sometimes you can eat food, you have a uh, indigenous guide showing you around and both of these places very much so follow that model culture format without, without probably really ha having known the legacy behind that. So at the same time that places like um, Saxman Village were being started in the 70s and just before that um, you have native people having a renaissance of arts and culture. I know that that happened around here at some point, I think in the 70s, cultural renaissance around here, 60s, 70s, um, where people are saying, no, we need to fight for our sovereignty, we need to fight for land reclamations, we need some apologies for things that happen, and we're going to take back our culture and our art. Um, so part of that is creating your own tourism destinations to tell your stories in your own way but yet the paradox is that um, the paradox is that you're unwittingly kind of stumbling into um, ways of representing yourself that, that, that um, might be working against your overall goals. So for a lot of indigenous communities, there's a big controversy over cultural commodification. This image here was taken at Wyora Spa, um, which is a Maori-owned spa at a geothermal park. And I saw that and I was like, really? How did that get past their elder consultant committee? Uh, I, I, I know it's, it's, it's a fine line. Sometimes it's fun to kind of make fun of yourself and be tongue in cheek, but sometimes it just reproduces um, touristic fantasies and ideas about, about the other, what Lena referred to as the tourist imagination. So I kind of just covered this point. I'll let you read it quickly. So now I want to talk a little bit about what tourists expect, um, which Lena set up so nicely for me. A lot of times tourists don't go to a destination and they want to see what's there, but they might not even necessarily be wanting to encounter indigenous cultures, but they're in a place where an indigenous community lives, so they encounter it. So I just want to clarify that right now I'm going to be talking about tourists who go someplace who specifically want to see indigenous people, the local people of the place. They're not happen to be there and happen to learn something along the way and have a nice time. Um, but this is a still from Dennis O'Rourke's 1988 film, Cannibal Tours. If you haven't seen it, it is the best film. I think you can stream it on YouTube, actually. So this is a scene from the film where, I don't know, the German or the Dutch tourists got to paint their faces uh, according to the way that the people up the, I want to say, Sepik River in, in New Guinea uh, painted their face. And they were just having a great time, but it was like kind of sick, kind of like a black face mocking is the way it came across in the film. But they're just having fun playing, playing, playing New Guinean, playing, playing indigenous. But, uh, but, the, but the desire is really to experience what we call in anthropology jargon, the other, not us. They want authenticity. And I kind of put this image up just a little bit tongue in cheek because um, I worked a couple years for Sitka Tribal Tours as a native guide. Sitka is in the heart of Clinkett country. I am not Clinkett, but they allowed me um, as an Alaska native to talk about their home from my experiences. But they had this ad that was going around for a while saying, experience Alaska with real Alaskans, kind of like tapping into that desire for authenticity. And I thought it was funny because a lot of times our tourists really wanted to encounter, um, you know, they probably want to encounter a clinket. 
They probably don't want to encounter people who are mixed, like me and Eric are. And, you know, they, they probably want um, somebody who speaks the language. We could fake it really well. We could do it. We can speak, clink it, but only enough as we need to, run, to do the tours or, or if we're at a ceremonial event to, to say what we need to say to do it. So, so that's a little bit tongue in cheek. One, one time I had a Canadian tourist, I was explaining all my family from both sides and the person was kind of confused about it. We were on a hiking tour and they said in the van on the way back, so that means you're a mongrel, right? <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so offended. Um, but uh, but I, you know, I think if you know me, I know a lot of you do, I love dogs, that's no insult to me. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I thought, you know, <laughs> That's not what they wanted. That wasn't their idea of authenticity. Um, tourists go to learn about themselves. They, want, they, they think they want to encounter the other, but really it's about validating who they are through experiencing someone who's completely different. And I can't tell you how many Cherokee princesses I've had on my tour or uh, <laughs> descendants of Cherokee princesses. It's just, it's like if you can say that, then you can be fully American you know, because somehow you can claim something that's attached to America, but they can never claim understanding any kind of genocide or any of the things that people talk about, you know, what we heard today and yesterday about um, the residential school experience. That's part of the, um, that's part of the identity today. Unfortunately, um, we live in a colonized nation. You can't just have your fun fantasy and because now you've met a real native person from somewhere, validate that as yourself. Um, so these are some of the, and, and then people come with a whole bunch of expectations related to dominant narratives in society about what indigenous, who indigenous people are and what they represent. And I just love, who's seen this commercial? It was a PSA from 1971. Uh, oh, some of the Canadians have seen it. Good. <laughs> um, I didn't know if it was shown in Canada. But that's Iron Eyes Cody. Um, he played Indians for years. He's a, of like Southern Italian descent, and he was in the famous PSA, to, it, canoeing up the river and crying a tear, a one lonely tear, when he saw some pollution. And then the the image pans out and he's in a, in a really dirty, smoggy city. So these dominant narratives that indigenous people are, um, you know, at one with the earth, that they're the icon of, of, um, of environmentalism. And yes, of course, people have relationships with their land, but it's not filtered through a Western concept of environmentalism or a fantasy of that. But, but these are the stories that get passed on through our society, through the media, through popular culture. Through um, and, and through books and TV and all the cowboys and Indians movies, people want to encounter that through tourism. So a lot of our job in working in tourism across the Pacific, you know, from Alaska to New Zealand, is to kind of disabuse people of their expectations and narratives and to bring them to a new story that's our story, but to do it in a way that's kind of subversive so that they're having fun all along. And you don't want to bunk them over the head with a frying pan. You want to bring them along with you so that you're, you become better friends and closer by the end of the experience. So it is tough, it is a challenge, but there's a lot in it for indigenous peoples. I think Alina touched on this as well. Creating jobs, telling our history from our point of view, getting people excited about promoting and protecting culture and perpetuating it, as we always say in Alaska. Increasing opportunities to record and pass on culture. Uh, increasing sense of pride and identity. I can't tell you how many young people I've met uh, from across the Pacific who said, I wouldn't have cared about my heritage if I hadn't have randomly gotten this job in tourism. And then they become culture bearers later. And then they really get into it. They look up, they hang out with their older people and their family and elders. And building relationships is so important for all the high level reasons that, that Lena pointed out. So I'll take one minute to finish up now. Um, just to say, give you four points that I noticed looking at comparing Alaska Native and Maori tourism. And that is that hospitality is what it means to be indigenous. 
Values are incorporated into the business. You can't check your values at the door and leave them at home and then, and then think that there's a set of Western business values that, that you need to use in tourism. You need to bring your local values to the business and that's what these businesses do. Uh, this idea of a collective leadership, even if it is a sole proprietorship type business, you still have to answer to other leaders in your community who direct things like protocols for visitors. Stewardship of land and natural resources, that your identity, and um, which is essentially what you're commoditizing, your identity, it's you that you're selling through tourism. It's, it's not, um, the experience is all about you. We're there to see you. It's, it's an identity thing, it's culture. Um, but that's very, very closely linked with stewardship of resources. And cultural perpetuation is really important across all these tourism businesses. As well as building understanding through education two ways. One way internally um, for, from within the community and externally teaching our visitors. So that, that I will stop here. And, uh, and that is the collection of the four main characteristics that I've seen shared across indigenous tourism models. 6,000 miles across the Pacific. Whoa.